Um, we are really happy to be partnering with the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Ranger chapter here on the seacoast in, in New Hampshire. Um, they've been uh, co-sponsoring this program with us for many years. In fact, they instigated this for us. Um, this is our monthly genealogy workshop held normally on the third um, Sunday um, of, of each month at between two and four. Today we did um, throw a curveball and, and um, changed it to 1 to 2.30 um, to accommodate Brenda's schedule, um, but we will go back to our regular 2 to 4 time next month. Um, and I apologize for those who received the, the incorrect time. I'm hoping we didn't lose some people because of that. We will be recording this talk today. Um, the recording will be available on our homepage soon, um, on the library's homepage. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you see all the recordings for our past programs. Um, this has been really nice to have, um, have some of our, our speakers and our presenters allow us to record. Not everyone allows us, so thank you, Brenda, for allowing us to record this today. Absolutely. Um, also, I will repeat that we are muting our audio and video for everyone, um, except for our, our um, library staff and our, our co-sponsors and, um, and Brenda, of course. Um, so if you want to ask questions or if you have any comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. At the end, uh, Brenda will answer those questions. Uh, Katie and I will um, feed them to her. Um, at the end, um, and then we will go until 2.30. We're going to try to be respectful of everyone's time, including Brenda. She has another program at 3. So uh, we'll try to fit in as much as we can in that time. I just want to also tell everybody about some of our upcoming program. First of all, um, our events calendar on our, our website is a good place to look, and our monthly newsletter if you don't subscribe to that, and I will put links to that in the chat after. Um, we have, in addition to online language groups, book groups, meditation, yoga, world affairs discussion groups, youth programming, an indigenous people series, and a standing up to racism workshop going on right now. There are lots of other programs that will be popping onto there, um, onto our, our calendar in the next months, and the newsletter is the best place to look for that. Um, in addition, I want to remind everybody about our COVID diary project that we're working on. Um, you can go online. I'll put that link on the chat as well after and just share your thoughts or pictures or um, experiences during this time. Um, just imagine the history, you know, 100 years from now, um, how much people will want to know what we were doing and thinking about all of this at this time. So um, if you would like to participate in that, you're welcome to do that and send us whatever um, you'd like to share about your life right now. Um, so in November, our genealogy workshop will be on Sunday, November 15th from 2 to 4. And Jennifer Schuer, who is on here, maybe she'll wave at us, <laughs> um, will be um, um, presenting a DNA program called Got My Ancestry DNA Results, Now What? Mm -hmm. Um, it's a beginner level session and it will help those who are new to DNA testing learn how to find their relatives and discover their ancestral roots using the DNA tools at Ancestry.com. More advanced researchers will benefit from learning about the newest tools and how to use them. So thank you, Jennifer, for being willing to share that with us again. Um, then, uh, let's see, October 29th, I'm, I'm going to mention this local history program because I think it's, it's um, of interest to this group, um, History folks. Um, it's co-sponsored by the Portsmouth Athenaeum. It will be Thursday, October 29th from 7 to 8.30, and it's called Votes for Women, A History of the Suffrage Movement with Liz Tenterelli. Um, Liz is the president of the League of Women Voters for New Hampshire, a nonpartisan organization that is a direct descendant of the National American Women Suffrage Association. Um, Liz will present um, the um, history of the campaign for women's right to vote and um, talk about the obstacles and how it relates to New Hampshire. So please join us for that one. Uh, no registration is required for that. There is registration required for Jennifer's program. Um, if you have any questions about library programming, feel free to ask me at the end or send me an email. Um, I'm also going to post at the very end a feedback form. The library loves hearing um, about what you thought about the program um, and also about what you'd like to see in the library in the future. Um, I'll share that at the end and if you fill it out, the best part is you will be entered into a, a little contest to win one of those wonderful Canvas library book bags. I was out front the other day at the library 
doing the, the curbside hold and a lady came and picked up her prize. She actually won the bag and she was so excited. So anyway, just want to say it does happen. Um, and then the, if, if there's anything that we share today um, that I feel that um, people will need in the future, I will send out a program follow up to all of the people who are registered um, with links or whatever happens to come up during the program, whether it's, you know, book links or, or whatnot. Um, so now I'd like to just introduce our presenter. Um, Brenda Sullivan is from the Gravestone Girls. This talk is called Past the Cemetery Gate, where we will learn to read the cemetery for clues and information. I'm going to let Brenda um, talk about the Gravestone Girls and about herself. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Brenda. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Let me get my screen up here for you guys. Um, while I can't see your faces, I see some names I recognize, so I'm grateful for that, uh, as well as the folks that are seeing us for the first time. And by us, I mean me. <laughs> Let's get this up here. My beautiful cemetery gate. There we go. All right, let us begin uh, past the cemetery gate. So this is the graveyard as a genealogical resource uh, and you are coming exploring with the gravestone girls. So up in the upper left hand corner, you see a picture of the gravestone girls in their natural habitat. Uh, that's me, I'm Brenda on the right in the sunglasses and purple boots. My web mistress Zipporah also her real name is Melissa. Uh, does all our social media, and my unconventional conventionalist seated there is Maggie. Uh, she is my best friend since way back when. Uh, Maggie and I grew up together in Central Mass, and Melissa grew up out in Western Mass, and together and separately we have been traversing cemeteries for many years. Gravestone Girls' mission is to keep our dead alive by preserving cemetery art and history. Shameless self-promotion to the website www.gravestonegirls.com. We are also on Facebook and Instagram at Gravestone Girls. If you are not already following us on social media, please do. I want to see my numbers up. And uh, in addition, being able to shop our Gravestone goods, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, on the website. There is also a section on the website called Learn. And in there, you will find links to a lot of the things that I talk about today, uh, as well as some handouts, glossary of terms and, and symbols and some a lot of the things that I talk about um, that you can download and print for yourself. So put them in your cemetery bag and take them along with you when you are out on the road. So Gravestone Girls do public presentations like this. Uh, we lead cemetery tours, real live walking tours once upon a time, and we will get back to them again. I'm actually thinking about scheduling one for next month if conditions allow, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we teach gravestone rubbing classes, not robbing, but rubbing, and there's an example of that in the lower left. Um, that is not something I'm going to address today. That's a separate topic and a rather lengthy one, so... Uh, and then also on the right is something else the gravestone girls do. We make replicas of gravestones, uh, typically from colonial era gravestones. Uh, there is an example of four of them in the picture on the right. They are cast directly from the faces of the originals. They're copies of the originals that still sit out on the cemetery landscape. Uh, they all have hooks on the back so they can hang on the wall. They're decorative. We also make magnets and coasters and pin boards and frames and all sorts of goodies. So check us out. And uh, one more shameless self plug that since I do a lot of work with genealogists, I often do uh, this type of casting or gravestone rubbing work as commission for my genealogists for typically people from farther away that trace their ancestry back to the New England area. All right, so that's enough shameless self promotion for now. Don't worry, I'll give you more later. Um, we are going to figure out how to use the cemetery as a resource. And there is, I'm going to teach you a whole bunch of things, including the difference between a graveyard and a cemetery. So there is absolutely a difference, um, and the difference is the landscape. Uh, and, and the landscape is a clue to the time frame and the social period which that space resides in. So there are three major errors 
of gravestone and cemetery evolution, um, three types of cemeteries slash graveyards. So these, this is a very typical colonial period graveyard, burial ground, uh, old burial place, all of those kind of words, not yet a cemetery. Um, the colonial period from first settlement through the 1700s. When you see this landscape, know that what you're looking at has absolutely changed over time. Uh, when, when you come into a town where you've never been before, and I can tell you that in pretty much most of all the uh, New England towns will have, if they date back far enough, they will have a colonial period graveyard. Um, and you can find them, if you've never been to that town before, look for, look for downtown, look for the original downtown, it may not be the current downtown, uh, look for your historic district, and look around for things like the original meeting house. I've got an example of a sign up at the top of this frame that, that marks the spot of the early meeting house. Uh, in the Mass Bay Colony, in order, early on, in order to get a charter for establishing a town, you had to meet a bunch of requirements, and two of them were establishing a meeting house and also establishing a burial ground. In the event you can't find the meeting house, take a look up in the sky and look for the beautiful steeples on our lovely New England, typically congregational or, or currently UCC, um, our old white steeple churches. They often sit on the original foundation of the meeting house. Um, or also look for City Hall, because City Hall may have once been Town Hall, and Town Hall may have once been the meeting house. So when you find it, like I said, what you see absolutely has changed over time. And the landscape here is a clue. All those nice, neat rows are an absolute sign that this space has been changed. And it may seem very strange to us with modern eyes that these sacred spaces would be reorganized or changed around or touched in any way to, to change them from what they originally were. So the, they change for a whole bunch of reasons. So because they're typically in the center of town, as we put in roads where there were no roads before or widen existing roads, it can eat into this space. Um, groundskeeping certainly affects how we change the layout of this. We want to be able to efficiently mow the lawn and keep the landscape looking good. Um, as we build buildings, that can eat into the landscape. Uh, once we understand concepts about sanitation, often we determine that we don't want old moldering bones in the middle of town. It may be a health hazard, so we may bury them under. Um, we may remove them all together and put them someplace else. And certainly over time, different periods of time, people will come in here and, and change the landscape for aesthetic purposes. To come in and say, These, this place is messy, we need, to, we need to clean it up, we need to make it look better to the eye, we, we need to reorganize. So all of those things play into the idea of, of the effects that happen to this colonial burial ground landscape over time. And remember, with some of our towns, those spaces have been out there for hundreds of years. So absolutely subject to change over time. This is the second period. This is called the rural or the garden cemetery movement of the 19th century. This is the first time that we bury our dead in a place called a cemetery. Uh, cemetery takes its word meaning from a, a Greek word. It takes its origin from a Greek word that means sleeping place or dormitory. It really reflects the modern ideology of the 19th century, of the industrialized 19th century, um, that we are moving from the farms and into the cities where working in the factories, the mechanizations of the factories are making life easier. Um, we are, we've got We've got writers of the time, the Hawthorns, the Thoreaus, and Longbows that are writing about preserving nature, communing with nature. We have the spiritualists and the transcendentalists of the time that are communicating with the spirits. So they are having their seances and their Ouija boards. Uh, we, we look at ourselves in this time in the 19th century as very modern people, completely, completely distinct and, and new from the colonialists the Puritans that came before us. 
So we change everything in the land of the living, and we certainly change everything in the land of the dead as well in terms of art, architecture, um, landscape design it becomes a thing, open green space becomes a thing. Um, the first time we have a cemetery in this country is Mount Auburn Cemetery, uh, founded in 1831 by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society and located in Cambridge, Mass. Um, we even, we, we changed the landscape altogether. So we are taking our cues from places like the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, we're taking cues from places like English garden landscapes. Uh, again, that idea of communing with nature. We have, we have beautiful plantings, we have green grass, rolling hills, places to walk, pathways to walk, uh, and we have monuments of different shapes, sizes, and materials. And then this is an example of a very commonly seen modern cemetery landscape of the 19th and 20th centuries. I'm sorry, the 19th and 1900s and the 2000s, so the 20th and the 21st centuries. This is really different from the, from the Victorians that we just saw. Uh, that there is a backlash as we come into the 1900s against all the over ornamentation and the, the high, high anxiety or high emotionalism, uh, high sentimentality that we see in the 19th century. So we want, there's an arts and crafts movement we, it makes its way over to us from England, so it affects our art and architecture in the land of the living, and again, it affects the art and architecture in the land of the dead. Um, we want to return the landscape to be more pastoral. We want it to be easier on the eye. We don't want it to be so busy like the Victorian cemeteries before it. We need to think about modern landscaping and how to, again, how to efficiently take care of these landscapes and uh, we have new materials available to us as well uh, in terms of it becomes, the change overcome becomes almost, almost completely granite. Um, and also never say never so. But the modern, uh, the, the, the modern preferred material that leans more towards granite and away from the previous slates of the colonial period and the marbles of the Victorian era. So you use the cemetery as a journey through time. You walk through those gates and you span hundreds of years of history in many cases. So you use that sort of as a chart to play our best Doctor Who. We play our best Doctor Who, and we learn uh, we learn to use it for a couple of different things. A little trouble here. Nicole, you can't hear me. Hold on, let's turn my cameras back on here. Hearing you, Brenda. Nicole, you got me? Nicole, you're cutting in and out a little bit, but um, I don't- I think Brenda, you came back, so I think it might be me. I'm sorry, everybody. Okay, no problem. I just I wanted to be sure. To know whether I'm sitting here talking to myself or not. So, all right, cool. Good, Thank good, you. good. No problem, no problem. All right. So we use the cemetery to journey through time, right? We walk through the gate and we span, we transcend hundreds of years. And we use the cemetery to find information about the past and the present. There is direct and indirect information available on the tombstones themselves, as well as, as how we interpret the landscape. Uh, and the cemetery and the old graveyards will absolutely reveal a picture, not just of the individuals that are buried there and the families that are buried there, but also absolutely reflects society at any particular point in time. So the direct information, just a few of a myriad of things, but these are kind of the highlights. What can we find by reading the faces of the gravestones? Um, we can find identities. So things like names, ages, genders, relationships. Um, we can figure out we can read who was married to who. Uh, we can figure, we can get told about this, this child was adopted by this family. Uh, we can make connections that way because it's written directly on the faces of the stones. Achievements, what did we do with ourselves while we were here? Uh, where did we go to school? What was our education? What did we do for work? Did we serve in the military? Hobbies and interests. What did we do with our free time? Who were we as 
as both individuals and, and the hobbies and, and interests that we have certainly reflect what's available to us as options at a particular point in time. Fraternal and social affiliations, did we belong to community groups that allowed us to socialize, uh, share common ground, and also do things for the community? Certainly, gravestones will tell you places of origin. Where did we come from? So-and-so was born somewhere, as well as places of death. The gravestone will also often tell you someone died somewhere and name a town or a location. And then I would say my last one, the last one on the list and my favorite would be method of death. Um, often very commonly seen, particularly uh, in the colonial and the Victorian period to see what it was that caused that person to end up in the graveyard. And then deductive information, how do we connect the dots? How do we do the math to figure out what we're looking at and how do we get more information? So the deductive information where the gravestones will say relationships, then can I look around at other stones and identify family, tie, family ties, who's married to who, how many times were they married, familial associations, um, and again, how many marriages and resulting children? I can look at the surrounding stones and, and piece it together. And I'm gonna show you how we do all of this. These are the highlights. Um, one of my favorites is age gaps between husbands and wives. Uh, wives often in the, if they lost a husband, they often were not, they sort of fulfilled their social obligation to be married uh, and didn't necessarily have to go on to be married. They often did out of necessity, um, but I find men continuously married over and over and over. Um, we can identify disease outbreaks and patterns of those outbreaks. And we can do that by looking at dates, and finding other dates, as well as having it say on the face of the stone that someone died of something. And then we go try and find correlations there with dates and other information. And certainly on a smaller scale, and from, from community diseases or outbreaks, um, insight to family tragedies. What did we have happen in a particular family that may have caused something to happen to more than just one person in a short period of time? And then certainly movement, points of origin and travel. Where did these people come from? How did they end up where we find them when we find them in the graveyard? So there's no way for me to say this is all the deductive stuff and this is all the, the, the stuff that you can get right off of the faces. They're always going to cross together. So you're the sleuth. You're the one coming in with the fresh eyes um, and some, maybe sometimes a notebook too to, to put down the ideas that you're seeing and then figure out how to knit them together, identify what they mean, and then how to go on and find more information. So. I'm going to walk you through these and we're going to do both deductive and, and direct identification. And certainly gravestones are going to tell you about identities and familial ties, uh, particularly if you go into a 19th century cemetery. In those 19th century cemeteries, for the first time, we have the opportunity to purchase a family plot. And that's in what you're looking at. That slide is an example of a family plot. It is the idea that the family's all together in life. And then one by one, they pass on and they go into this family plot where they are eventually all reunited. Um, when you come into a cemetery and you are looking for the colonials, well, this is not a colonial, this is not a colonial visual. So you can, if you're in a large space, you can scan the horizon and say, okay, I'm looking for the colonials and the colonials look like this. So I'm going over here. And nope, I'm looking for my 19th century folks and hey, these are marvels and their family plots. So I'm gonna go over here. So just visualizing what's on the landscape can help get you started and narrow your focus if you're looking for something specific. Within that, family plots will help you narrow it down further. And they will give you a, a lot of information on the faces of the stone of who's who, how they're related, both directly by what's written, may say wife of so-and-so, child of daughter of so-and-so, um, and, and on and on. So you get a lot of direct and indirect information off gravestones in family plots. I get visual identification. 
Um, this is typically 19th century and forward. So if you, I'll get to the colonials and, and, and visual identification there in terms of the individuals because there is, there is definitely a difference. So actually seeing the faces of the people whose gravestone I'm standing at ha can happen very easily. Uh, right on the face of the stone itself. In the upper left-hand corner, I have a, a bronze cast bas relief. I have no doubt that that is meant to be the guy in the grave. Uh, the one on the right, in the top right, that lovely lady in the hat, that is called a photo ceramic. It is a piece of ceramic, a ceramic disc that has a photo laminated to the top of it and then sealed up. So, and then attached to the gravestone, and in this case, it's actually, a hole has been cut and it's been embedded flush on the face of the stone. It gives me an absolute picture of the, the occupant of grave in front of who I'm standing in front of. Uh, down below, um, that is called, uh, that happy couple there. So that's on a modern gravestone. Uh, our current popular choice of gravestone material is black granite. So it, when you go into the modern section of the cemetery and you see all these black shiny gravestones, that's typically polished black granite. And it lends itself very nicely to this type of picture making on its face. They're called gravestone etchings. Uh, they are sometimes done with laser, but they are more often done with uh, diamond tip tools by very talented people that actually stroke by stroke etch an image into the face of that black granite. So right out of the gate, I've got an identification. I've got a picture of somebody here. Um, and you can further put dating and, and often very specific dating to these kinds of images. Uh, you, as genealogists, you guys may be familiar with a woman named Maureen Taylor. She is known as the photo detective. Uh, she uh, makes a career out of identifying people and places and dates based on photographs. So certainly in any of these three examples, whether it's the size of his mutton chops and, and that he has mutton chops, um, or or her or the the photo ceramic her hat or uh, uh, the you know the hairstyles anything like that they are all very much dictated by time periods and social norms we we do a lot of things that everybody else is doing and, and fashion and hairstyle is certainly amongst that so it's it can be easy to identify or there's methods to identify based on those kind of attributes. Um, I want you to know too that the idea of putting imagery is not on gravestones is not a new idea. So certainly the bas-relief bronze up in the left is a 19th century uh, object, but also in the lower right hand corner that beautiful gloved hand is pulling back the cover over a niche that absolutely would have held a photograph. So photography was invented in 1839, so keep that in mind when you are looking at photographs on gravestones. Um, and it becomes something that is read, it becomes readily available to the population. The technology moves really fast and it, it makes it affordable. And certainly before it was affordable, if you had money, you could do it. So when you find gravestones with cutouts like that, you know, if we're lucky, they have a, a, a lovely little swinging cover on the top of it to protect what would have been in there. Um, or or it's, just the, it's just the opening itself. But even the size of that opening, whether it's a small square or a larger square, uh, that in conjunction with the death date on the stone might help you identify uh, what kind of photography it was, whether it was a, a daguerreotype, an ambrotype, or a tin type. Um, I think this is a good spot to remind you that you don't always get a gravestone when you die. And I gotta say that if I'm going to put a picture of myself on my gravestone and I live to be 90 years old, it is not going to be when I'm 90 years old. It's going to be when I was young and beautiful and 18 years old. So take that into consideration um, when you're trying to do dating.
Also, I often get a question about those gravestones with the cutouts. Have I found one with a picture in it? The answer to that is no, not yet, but I am waiting. Uh, I have heard that uh, there have some, some have been found up in Maine uh, and also in the Midwest. I have not yet found any myself and Maine's a really big state and they do, usually when people find them, they tend to keep it to themselves and they may share the photo, but they will not necessarily share where it is. And it's certainly something to take into consideration because you wanna protect these things. If they're still out there, you want them to stay out there. Marriages, births, and adoptions. What can those gravestones tell me about the people that those gravestones are for? People make their own gravestones, particularly nowadays, you, you, if you wanna have a say, get it done before you leave this place, make your own stone, or at least leave your wishes and see if your family does it for you. And, and your family erects gravestones for their loved ones. So a lot of what goes on there is about how people are connected and how they wanna be remembered. Um, this is an example of a black granite gravestone. Uh, I took this picture a really long time ago, somewhere in the wilds of Pennsylvania. I could not tell you where without going and looking it up, um, but I took it because it was one of the first times I had seen this black granite material used for gravestones. And you can tell that I don't know how to take pictures of it because that's me, that's my reflection you see on the stone, and that bright light in the middle is not a cemetery orb, but the flash of my camera. So they can be tricky to take pictures of. Don't stand directly in front of them, stand off to the side so that you're not in it as well as, so you can get a good, a good shot of what you're trying to take a photograph of. So I can't tell you where this is without looking it up. I don't know the people. But I can tell a lot about these people just by looking at what's on the gravestone. So I don't know whether I pronounce their last name Bailski or Valeski, but I do know a bunch of things. I know that they were spiritual to some effect by the image on the left. And remember, this is also gravestone etching, another great example of it. Um, they've got a dog. They had a dog. They had three lazy cats, as if cats come in any other variety. And so that's all the stuff I can see on the front, right? That's my direct information. My deductive information is math in this case. Um, I can do the math and figure out uh, how old Alfred was when he died. Uh, I can figure out how old Alfred and Roberta were when they got married, because I can see that they got married April 22nd, 1972. Um, I can do the math and tell the age difference between Alfred and Roberta. And as of the picture taking, because there is no end date for Ms. Roberta, um, I can possibly, I can lean towards the idea that at the time that the photograph was taken, she was still with us. So that idea of the family plot and the connections that you make, I have a family plot here with from left to right, the first wife, the husband, the third wife, and then the second wife, Anna, on the far right. So, and I know that the, the second wife is the second wife because it actually says on her gravestone that she was the second wife. Um, so I now know the pecking order, as it were. I, I now know the, the family order, the marriage order, by what I was able to read. And now I can go and do math and I can figure out with some degree of certainty, not absolutely, but I can lay the foundation for how long, was, how old were they in, you know, what were the age gaps in between? Um, can I figure out, can I try to get a sense of how long they were married? If I can get, if I can kind of tease out some of that information and I write it down, when I go to look in family records, uh, with the historical society, I can go look at the, the cemetery records themselves if they still exist. Uh, I can start, I can use that as my foundation to piece more timeline and relationship information together. So again, I've got three wives, one husband, and this is a close up of his gravestone. And apparently he thinks that once he left here, there would be rest in heaven. On my left, Susanna E. 
the only child of Mr. William and Mrs. Susanna Williston. So that information was good as of 1829. You know, they they are doing they're putting this on to, to put that extra extra mode of sentimentality or extra idea of this was my only one. This is a, a large, a huge loss, and there is bereavement, of course. Um, but at the time in 1829, she was that little girl was eight months old in 20 days. So at the time the stone was put up, maybe she was the only one. Uh, you need to survey the area. Do I find any more children of the Willistons? Um, and not just here, if I'm looking for this particular information, not just here in this in this cemetery, but also in other town cemeteries around. Don't don't confine yourself to just one place. Um, and maybe even depending on how much you need that information, maybe you also need to look outside of that particular town uh, to see if maybe they had another spot somewhere, they may have moved. Uh, it, it's not impossible that if you had one little girl that died at eight months old in the 19th century, it's it's not beyond the realm of possibility that she would have more children afterwards, but certainly at the time it indicates that she was the only one and the firstborn. To my right, I have Miss Judith Nurse, daughter of Mr. John Nurse, and an adopted daughter of Mr. Solomon Barnes and Judith, his wife, who died August. So there's your abbreviation with that with that superscript T, August 7th AD, which is Latin for Anno Domini, so in the year of. 1797 in the 19th year of her age. So as you as genealogists may know, um, women were tied to men constantly um, through from the colonial period through the 19th century and, and really an awful lot into modern time. So, you know, you're somebody's daughter, you're somebody's wife. In this case, you're not only the daughter of Mr. John Nurse, but Judith is also the adopted daughter of Solomon Barnes and Judith, his wife. So what I seem to have here that sets me out on the path from what I can deduce from what I read, um, or what I can read and then go make my deductions, uh, that, that John, something happened to Judith's father, John. And it would appear that her mother also named Judith, but not necessarily, but possibly you got to take that into consideration that she may be, she may be the mother, she might be an aunt, uh, that the that the mother or, or that the, uh, the adult Judith then went on to marry Solomon Barnes, and he took Judith in as his child, um, even though she still bears the name the surname nurse of her father. So I got a lot going on there to tease out. Miss Sally, daughter of Mr. Samuel and Mrs. Nancy Butler. So again, there's that connection. She's somebody's daughter. Uh, she died at the age of 20. And by calling her Miss and tying her to her family, we can deduce that she has not been married, was not married at the time of her death. In the middle, I have Mrs. Catherine Bacon, relict of Major Ebenezer Bacon and formerly widow of Captain Jabez Gay. So I got a bunch of stuff going on here. Relict is a term for widow that we just don't use anymore. It means widow. Um, and also if you see consort, that also means wife of. So if you took the T off the end of relict, you have the word relic. So it kind of, if you need to use that as a way to remember the relic, something that remains after. So she was the widow of Major Ebenezer Bacon, and previously she was married, so formerly widow, previously married to and widow of Captain Jabez Gay. So Mrs. Catherine did pretty well for herself. First she married the captain, he died, and then she went on to marry the major, and then he died. So she's left standing with a couple of great titles and I hope a really good estate. To my right, I have Mrs. Elizabeth Colt. So again, there's that term relict of Thomas Cole, your abbreviation with that superscript is for Thomas, of Boston. 
He died January 13th, 1813. There's that AD, Anno Domini, again, in the year of 1813. And then that AET is a Latin abbreviation, is an abbreviation for a Latin term called etatus, um, at the age of, so AD, Anno Domini, in the year of, etatus, achieved the age of, or in the age of, 102. So, again, a whole bunch of stuff going on here. If, so we, we tend to think that they didn't live very long um, in, in the 16, 17, 1800s. Uh, and I don't have scientific information, you know, real stats, real scientific proof. Uh, but I certainly see just by being in thousands of cemeteries and seeing tens of thousands of gravestones, I see plenty of gravestones for people that live to be 70, 80, 90, and, and certainly three digits, while unusual, not, not terribly rare, you know, not, not terribly uncommon. So if you take it straight on at face value, 102, died in 1813, she would have been born in 1711. So just take a minute to think about how much she would have seen in the course of her life. But again, as genealogists, you guys often know, maybe I should take some of this information with a grain of salt. Um, certainly when you're born in these time periods in the, in the 18th century, you don't necessarily get good documentation. Um, some people didn't know exactly when they were born or how old they were. So sometimes they make it up or sometimes they backdate themselves. Um, and certainly you've got, uh, you've got information in, that you could help with this, help sort of make this, make this true or, or debunk it um, by looking at things like censuses uh and vital records because certainly if she lived to be 102 you you've got a whole bunch of censuses and a whole bunch of vital records to go by uh there's also a lot of lore that happens in families too so you may have this uh this story that goes on through the family that great aunt elizabeth lived to be 102 uh, so you have to take that into consideration as well, particularly as it pertains to actually getting a gravestone. A um, couple of things about the gravestone. So it says relic, so the widow of Thomas Cole of Boston. Well, that's great. This gravestone is in Central Mass in Marlboro. So how did Mrs. Elizabeth Colt get to be buried in Marlboro? If I look around, where she where her gravestone is where she's buried do i see anybody else do i find thomas cole do i see any relatives related to her anybody i can tie together with her uh in this case no i actually can't so i don't know where thomas cole is um you know maybe out because she was the widow maybe she moved afterwards so maybe he's in boston and, and she moved out to the country marlboro certainly would have been the country at the time uh as well as so just the shape and imagery on that gravestone i've got that urn at the top that rounded lunette is called the tympanum and then i've got square shoulders those are the on, on either side you can see that it goes it goes square shoulder and then the tympanum where the urn is and then another square shoulder so i've got a death date of 1813 and remember you don't always get a gravestone when you die right away. You know, it, it can come right away. It can come a year later. It can come five years later. It can come 30 years later. And gravestones get replaced as well. So you have to think about all of that when you're looking at gravestones and, and trying to interpret the information on the faces of them. Uh, while 1813 is not unusual for the idea of the square shoulders and uh, the urn or the urn and willow motif it is a little early in my opinion um it is a little early for 1813 so it may be that i've got you know i i've got to entertain all possibilities when i when i come up with scenarios in my head to then try and go figure out 
um, I will, you know, maybe I have a family, like I said, that there's family lore that great aunt Lizzie lived to be 102 and gee, you know, we don't have a gravestone for her. We should put one up to commemorate her as well as the age that she achieved. Or uh, maybe she had an older gravestone with older imagery and the family came along and this happens all the time as well. The family later generations come along and go, oh no, this is not befitting of a woman that lived to be 102. And we are going to honor her more appropriately with a more modern gravestone and more modern imagery. So you have to take all of that kind of stuff into consideration uh, and, and sort of tell yourself the stories and then go try and figure them out. But in just those few words and in that one picture, you've got a lot of leads to start tracking down. Achievements, what did we do with ourselves while we were here? Um, sometimes we did great big things, sometimes we did little things. Uh, I wanted to use this as an example of great big things. So this is a, a hill tomb and it is fantastic Egyptian revival architecture. And what that facade is, that pyramid facade is actually built into the hill behind it. That door opened up into a chamber and it's called a hill tomb. This happens to be the Egyptian revival hill tomb for Henry Berg, who was the founder of the ASPCA, the Association, the Society for the Pre Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Uh, and later on, he goes on to also fund the Society for the Prevention of, found and fund the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. So when this, when this monument went up, when this, this, uh, hill tomb, this architecture went up, it did not go, I'm almost positive, um, with all of that bronze on the doors about who he was and what he did and with that, with that statuary out there of all the animals and the, and the person with the animals, most certainly put in later to, to go and probably by the society um, as a way to highlight what he did while he was here. So we can have great big achievements and we can have little bitty achievements uh, and everything in between. But if you wanted to know more about him, don't be ashamed to Google stuff because Google is often the answer to everything. It feels like cheating, at least I think it does when I do it, but I mean, it's a fabulous repository of information. Uh, and remember, don't believe everything you read, but again, use it as a piece of information to build your whole narrative. Education, where did we go to school? What did we do? Certainly on the left, I've got a photo ceramic of a young woman who looks like she's in a sweater that has a megaphone on it. So I'm gonna take the leap and interpret that, that if you're in a sweater with a megaphone on it, uh, you're probably a cheerleader or a part of the pep squad. Go one step further and notice that there are initials on that megaphone, FHS. So where do you get pep squads and, and cheerleaders? Well, you get them in high school. So I probably got a high school picture here. Now all I have to do is figure out what the F stands for. And while, when you look at this, you go, okay, so am I in an F town? Am I in Franklin? Am I in Fall River? Am I in Framingham? And if I am not, well, what towns are around me? Because remember, we have regional high schools as well that bring multiple towns together. Um, is there a surrounding town that starts with the letter F? You can, you can probably get through this pretty quick um, and make the connection. And when you do, you can go find our yearbook. The libraries will have these, the historical societies will have these. Um, I will go out on a limb and say that really looks like a high school yearbook picture. So you would, and we're going to go with the idea that that gravestone probably has her name on it. So you put those things together and you can probably find her pretty quickly. Uh, and, you know, we all wrote memories in our yearbooks. So uh, we might be able to get a, a great, a great little glimpse of personal information just because we followed the lead on that picture. Over on my right, I have a 
I certainly have a gravestone for a minister. This is a fabulous colonial period gravestone. And um, I can tell that they're ministers because they have these, they have the ecclesiastical robes on, they're holding Bibles in their cute little hands. And certainly uh, if you were in the clergy, particularly in the colonial period, you were probably educated at Harvard, Harvard Divinity School. Um, and so you take it right from there and you go, you take names and dates off of the gravestone and you go look at Harvard and, and see if you can make a match with your clergy member. And if you can't, then check Lee Hill. Occupations. So here again, I have another minister and I used him specifically for this, for, for an illustrative purpose, a couple of them actually. So what I have is uh, Reverend Nathan Holmes, how to read, you think I'd know by now, Holt, I'm sorry. Uh, Reverend Nathan Holt. And it goes on to read that he was the pastor of the Second Church of Danvers. Well, that's great, but this gravestone and this burial is in Peabody. Peabody was established in 1855 from Danvers. Okay, well, he died in 1792, 52. Hard to read. I, again, I should know this, but anyway, so he was... Uh, Danvers was established in 1752 from Salem. So something tells me on the face of that gravestone that I need to go back again. And Salem was established in 1631 and happens to be right next door to Peabody. So when you're standing in a town and you read something about somebody that says that they were for, from somewhere, or in this case, they were minister of the Church of Danvers, and you, you got to think, stop for a minute and think, where am I? Am I in Danvers? No, I'm not. I'm in Peabody. Okay, well, how are those, how are those connected? And you often will have to take those multiple steps back through time uh, to figure out how the towns were connected and how I have, who I have, where I have them. And this is my example of pictures on colonial gravestones are not the occupants in the grave. Very different from what I showed you with the 19th century and the modern gravestone pictures, the, the casts, the photography, the etchings. The, the imagery on colonial gravestones is not the individual in the grave. It is meant to be the idea of being human. And if I was to find Reverend Holt's gravestone by itself, I, I would want to take the leap that that is an image of the good reverend. It is not. Carvers of the colonial period carved in particular styles. Some carve the same styles through their whole career. Others, others uh, evolved over time. So if you traverse the, the graveyards of New England, you are going to find a whole bunch of different ministers on gravestones and images of them, like the one down in the lower right. He bears some resemblance to the good Reverend Holt, but he is a different Reverend and he is in a different town. He's in Ipswich. So do not misinterpret the idea that human looking images on colonial gravestones are the occupant of that grave. They are not, but they're really cute. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of information to kick off a search. And I was particularly interested in this gravestone for Dr. Susan S. McKinney Stewart, 1846 to 1918, illustrious through faith as wife, mother, physician. So yeah, still tiring her to be a wife and mother, but I've got two references here to the idea that she was a doctor. And she's not just a doctor, she's a woman doctor in the 19th century and crossing, perhaps crossing over into the 20th, uh, into the 20th century as well. And it didn't take me long to enter her name into Google as a first step to try and find some information and, and be on my way down the rabbit hole. Uh, she has a Wikipedia page. And remember, take all that stuff on the internet with a grain of salt. It's good information. It is, it is not gospel. 
So it is a piece of information that you will use to put a whole picture together. Um, so my, my Googling of the good doctor returns this beautiful Victorian image. She was the first African-American woman physician in New York State and third in the United States. He was graduated valedictorian of her class in 1870 from the New York Medical College for Women and practiced medicine in Brooklyn and Manhattan from 1870 to 1895. There, it goes on and on to talk more about all of her, all of her work. But in, in just this initial paragraph, I've got a tremendous amount of information. Um, and it certainly, it, that is certainly a more modern gravestone. Um, it's a 20th century gravestone uh, and it's made out of granite and it only has a little bit of imagery, a little bit of information on it. But look at all the things that it's given me. I've got a whole bunch of places that I can go look for more information. I can look, um, I can look for records of physicians in New York State. I can look for records of, at the New York Medical College for Women because God forbid we let the women go to school with the men in 1870 or in the 1900s for that matter. Um, and certainly I can look for, again, censuses, um, uh, business directories for Brooklyn and Manhattan for her practicing medicine between the years of 1870 and 1895. Uh, so again, don't be ashamed to Google. Look where it, look where it will get you started. I would be remiss as a gravestone girl if I did not include a gravestone of a gravestone carver or made by, made by a gravestone carver. When you're looking at gravestones, particularly in the colonial period, or actually the 19th century as well, uh, you will often find maker's marks. They're going to be at the bottom, typically at the ground level. Um, they will, they will be, uh, as you can see that, that it's smooth and then it's rough under, it's underneath the, the engraving. So it is, that rough spot would have been underground. So that signature engraved by Israel Reed Worcester would be right at ground level. And of course, these stones move and shift by freezing and thawing over the years. But don't forget to look down because you can often find a really good piece of information. Um, and, and yeah, all right, I'm going to go there. You will also be able to look at probate records and you can look for payments out of an estate in a probate record to somebody for a gravestone or gravestone lettering. So that can be another way to find information. Um, this one, I happen, you know, they happen to tell me who made it. And the thing I want you to notice here in the, in the name, Israel, it looks different, right? That doesn't look like an S, it looks like the letter F. And what it is, is an old style, old English S, where the tail of the S drops down below the line. And it often, and this looks like it might have it as well, it often has a crossbar across it as well. And so we don't use that anymore, so it may look foreign, you know, I get a lot of people that read this and go, Ephrael, what's that mean? Well, if you read it out loud and it doesn't make sense, try something else. Try looking back at language of that particular time period and it will help you get an answer. If you keep going over to the word Worcester, there again, the S in Worcester is that old English S, but you'll notice that it's also connected to the T at the top. That's called a ligature. And it's just a, a little fancy bit of carving that the carver did to make it look that much nicer. Uh, and also it's just a little bit faster because he just takes the S, rolls it into the T, never has to lift his chisel. Military service. We served our country in many ways and it's very often on the gravestones. So I have Mr. Francis Washburn here, Brevet Brigadier General, Colonel, 4th Regiment, Massachusetts Cavalry, died 22nd April, 1865, of wounds received at High Bridge, Virginia, 6th April, 1865, aged 26 years. 
And again, I've got a tremendous amount of information in a very few bit of words. So Brevet Brigadier General. So I know in service, his rank was Colonel of the 4th Regiment of the Massachusetts Cavalry. Brevet Brigadier General means to be breveted is to be bumped up in class in the military without actually going through the steps. So he was made, he would serve as a colonel, but he was breveted up to Brigadier General. If this is typically done posthumously. It is also typically done by the President of the United States. Uh, in the case of Mr. Washburn, it says that he died from wounds received at Highbridge, Virginia. So it's a battle wound, uh, and, and it was pro that brevet was pro he was probably breveted because of dying from the injuries in that battle. Um, and you just you can look up what was this battle in Highbridge, Virginia. Um, I've got an approximate date of when the, this this conflict would have taken place if he got the wounds April sixth. So now I've got a, a time period to look at. Uh, you might be able to find information about that Civil War battle. You might be able to find where the closest hospital, military hospital, has been taken to, and then find the records to see if you can if you can locate him in those military hospitals receiving treatment, um, as well as he was injured on the sixth. But he hung around for, do some math, uh, for 16 days and died on the 22nd and managed to make it long enough to see the end of the Civil War. Hobbies and interests, what did we do with ourselves while we were here? On my left, I've got a nice bench in the sunshine. It invites the, it invites the visitor to come and sit down. I got a young man playing guitar, and certainly it's not only an invitation to sit, but maybe it's an invitation to sit and put on your headphones and listen to your music. Um, to go further, if you put an image like this of a, this young man playing guitar, it must have been something he loved to do. You read the words below that that are quotated, let your soul shine. Here's another great opportunity. Just stick those words into Google and see what you get. Well, what I got was a line from an Allman Brothers song. So now not only do I know that this young man played guitar, I also know what kind of music influenced him. And maybe because the Allman Brothers were such guitar gods, um, maybe that's what in inspired him to pick up the guitar in the first place. On my right, I have got a, a boat and a game fish. You know, not that's not just any fish that we're going out fishing for. So maybe he's a sports fisherman, like to do it for himself. Maybe he ran a business. Uh, I've got, I've got a, a specific interest going on here. It's not just fishing, it's a specific type of fishing. And I would say from the perspective of this carving, he's gonna need a bigger boat for that fish. Certainly, we would love to talk about what we loved. And one of the things that we love is our sports teams. And I've got the Red Sox up there. I certainly see Patriots. Uh, I see some Bruins. And I got to say, then these are all Massachusetts teams. Uh, I got to say, I don't see many, I don't see many logos for the Boston Celtics. I don't know why. And certainly, if your funeral flowers are a royal straight flush, you must have been one good poker player. Fraternal and social affiliations. What kind of community groups did we align ourselves with? What groups did we join? And what did they do with these social groups? Did they do community work? And certainly these are but a few. Um, were they our genealogy? Do they hearken back to our heritage? So on the left, I've got the Daughters of the Confederacy. And on the right, I've got the emblem for the Daughters of the American Revolution. So descendants that tie them, their lineage back to these particular periods of time. Um, I've got K of C, not the chicken, but the Knights of Columbus, uh, a social organization, an Italian social organization. 
Below that, BPOE, the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks. So they're a lot like the lions and the Kiwanis and, and all of those social groups uh, that do, do work for the community. In the middle, I have a, a Freemason, a, un, a Free and Accepted Order of Masons, which started as a, an organization for men in the Mason trade, in the, in the stone trade. Uh, and I've got a tremendous amount of symbolism there. I've got the square and compass that's on the Bible. Um, I've got the ladder. I've got some. I've got some tools. I've got. I've got the moon. I've got. That is just screaming. I was a Freemason without ever actually saying I was a Freemason. And but below my Daughters of the American Revolution is the Ladies Auxiliary for the Freemasons, the Order of the Eastern Star. And they've got this great five-pointed triangle with all of the, the symbols inside of them. This is all biblical stuff. Um, and it says fatal, which I always think is just the greatest. But it stands for, it, it doesn't mean they're deadly. It stands for fairest among thousands, altogether lovely. So this is the ladies auxiliary side of the Freemasons. Um, but I will say men can be part of the Eastern Star as well, but the ladies can't be part of the Freemasons. Although I do think somebody recently told me that's changed, which is good because I want in and all the secrets. And then below that, I've got another uh, community organization. Uh, I, we, have, we had them. I had members of the family in the Grange. Uh, P of H, the Patrons of Husbandry. So this is an agricultural social organization. Movement and travel. We may forget that people have been traveling all over the world for a long time. And what I have here is examples of a, a new glossary term for you called the cenotaph. So on the left, I've got uh, this family and it notes that the woman was is buried in Arlington. So not Arlington Cemetery. I'm assuming that it's Arlington, the town in Massachusetts, because this gravestone is in Lexington and Arlington is not very far away. So see, there's my deductive reasoning. Um, and then on the right, I've got a stone for a young man who was drowned in the Pacific Ocean near the port of Lima. I didn't have to look it up. It's carved right there on the face of the stone. Uh, and it goes on to say that the stone was erected in his memory by his two surviving brothers. So that port of Lima is Lima, Peru. So we made our lives off the ocean, whether we were fishermen, whether we were, whether we were um, merchants, we traveled. And if, if you fall off the boat in the Pacific Ocean, chances are pretty good they are not recovering your body. So what I have here is examples of two gravestones for two people that are not there. And that's what a cenotaph is. I've got a memorial. It says their names, but they are not physically buried in that location. It is meant to be memorial. It's a way for the family to have somewhere to go. It is a way to, to keep that person alive, if you will, um, on that gravestone, on the landscape. and even though I don't have a physical body. My favorite, methods of death. So things like accidents, disease, war, you name it, we see it on the faces of the stones. So on my left, Mr. Thomas Lynch, late of Ireland. So now right there on the face, I know he, he came from Ireland. This stone is in Sterling, Massachusetts. So that's a far cry away from Ireland. Uh, was killed by the fall of a tree. So this guy got up in the morning, had chores to do. One of them was to clear the land. And I guess it didn't go so well. And I'm making that assumption that he had got up to clear the land. But somehow a tree fell on him and he was killed. So that's it. That's the end of him. He didn't expect that to happen today. So those kind of messages are put on early, early gravestones, particularly in the colonial period, to remind the living reader about the brevity of life, that you can be here one minute and gone the next, and the work that you did here by your deeds 
uh, by your words and deeds were what you were measured on to get on to the next world. On the right, I have a stone in memory of Thomas Dale, who casually fell from Springfield Bridge, December 26, died 27, 1814, in the 30th year of his age. Casually fell. So this is like the lettering that I was talking about. When you read something and it doesn't make sense or it sounds funny to you, oops, I slipped and fell off the bridge. I casually fell. Um, the word casually in the 19th century was another word for accident. So this is the idea that he accidentally fell from the bridge. So you have, when something doesn't make sense, it might be because we use, we don't use that word anymore, or that word means something different than it meant 150 years ago. So you have to take that into consideration. And something else you need to take into consideration with both of these is that newspapers of the time would have reported on this stuff. You know, if you look at old, old newspapers, they're full of tiny, tiny print and, and lots of it. So they were writing of all kinds of things, all sorts of interest stories, big or small. And certainly if you get killed by a tree, you might make the paper. And certainly if you fell off the Springfield Bridge, you made the paper. So probably you made the paper when it happened on, on or around the 26th or 26th the 27th, because you got to at least have time to get it into print. Um, and then you'd probably read about it in the paper again to announce that he died on the, that he died on the 27th of December. And there might be another mention of it in the paper when in refer in reference to obituaries or funeral services. So that stuff exists. One other thing you need to take into consideration with, uh, with my Springfield Bridge guy is that in the 19th century, particularly back in the first quarter of the 19th century, when he died in 1814, you know, that date, December 26th, Christmas time, right? So what we do with Christmas today and what Christmas has come to represent in terms of being a family holiday, being commercial, uh, is, a, is a, an evolution of what Christmas was originally. Uh, when it starts getting celebrated here in this country. Uh, it is, it's a whole lot like Halloween, actually. It was rival, it, it was, um, it was running through the streets and banging on doors and singing and begging for food and, and, and drink, certainly. Uh, it was a party and it was an adult party. It was not for the kiddies. So you need to take that into consideration that the way we may view holidays, he died in a period of a holiday, well, how was that holiday, how did that holiday manifest back then at the time versus how we deal with it today? So keep that in mind as well. Um, this is a single gravestone for five children that belong to this family. And know that, I've mentioned you don't always get a gravestone when you die. You might get one much later. So when you have a single stone like this, it is no earlier than the end of December in 1761. Uh, and again, it might be, you, particularly in the colonial period, you don't necessarily expect, while you expect death, you don't necessarily have the money to pay for the stone at the time of the death. So. In this case, certainly something happened in 1716 between 1760 between October and December, and then I've got another death almost a full year later in 1761. So what happened in 1760? So I would look around, I would keep this stone in mind, I would look around at the other gravestones, and do I see more deaths in other families in the last quarter of the 1760s or spilling over into 1761? Does that grave, if I find other gravestones with this time frame of death dates on it, does it tell me what they died of? And one of the things you'll find is that we had a, a pretty significant smallpox outbreak in Massachusetts in 1760. So once I piece all of that together, um, 
both from the gravestones as well as just sifting through the time period. You know, there's, there's a lot of great resources out there that document disease. It's fascinating dinner reading. And it, it will tell you a lot about disease in different time frames, and you can help knit that. That will help you knit stuff together. Important sites you need to know. I'm going to leave this up and walk through it. Uh, feel free to snap a picture of it. And you can also find these resources and more on the Gravestone Girls website uh, in that learn section. So there it is, top in your list, gravestonegirls.com. You may all be familiar with Find a Grave. So Find a Grave is a completely crowdsourced repository to document cemeteries and gravestones in the United States. So it's people going out into the cemetery, taking pictures, uploading them, and putting commentary with it often. So remember, definitely grain of salt with this. While this is a terrific resource, it is full of errors. So absolutely keep that in mind. Uh, it is a great place to find pictures of the gravestones you're looking for. But when you have folks writing about stuff, it's uh, it, it can be just flat out wrong. So remember that. Um, and the Association for Gravestone Studies, this, this group is Massachusetts based, but we have members all over the world. They've been around for about 40 years. Our members are everybody from gravestone carvers to gravestone girls to, to educators and archaeologists and, and everybody in between. If it has anything to do with a gravestone or a cemetery, whether it's trees or stones or art or whatever, our members are, are part of the group. Uh, they, they exist for the purpose of documenting these important, uh, documenting and educating these important uh, historical artifacts. And, and they are absolutely cultural artifacts as well. So great repository for information. They've got e-newsletters that you can sign up for for free. You don't have to be a member. Uh, and if you are a member, you get a quarterly published publication and an annual scholarly publication on all sorts of different topics. And all of the topics are created by the members based on their travels or based on whatever they're studying, their thesis papers and everything in between. The Farber Gravestone Collection is a fabulous resource. Um, I think this link is still good. I've had a little trouble with it lately. If you can't get there through the Luna Commons that I've put up there, um, you can definitely get to it at the next resource, the American Antiquarian Society. So the Farbers were a husband and wife team working in the cemeteries in the 1970s with cameras, taking pictures of gravestones to document them, but also to try and do carver, or gravestone carver identification. Uh, by the time they were done, they had almost 14,000 images of about 9,000 gravestones. The collection was donated to the next on the list, the American Antiquarian Society, and the American Antiquarian Society digitized the collection. So now you can get it online. It's fabulous. You can sift the collection by location, by carver, by date, by image. There's a lot of great ways to parse out the content. It has a few drawbacks. So certainly they didn't get to every cemetery everywhere in New England. Um, and and they, they didn't get to every gravestone. Also, when the collection was digitized, some of the members of the AGS, the Association for Gravestone Studies, that are carver experts in their own right, help the Antiquarian Society put documentation information on here in terms of carvers or, or other identifying information. Not everybody, it, it, and that was done when the collection was put up maybe 10 years ago, give or take, and has not been updated. So there's more we know that did not get fed into that collection. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, the American Antiquarian Society is in Worcester, Massachusetts just down the street from the Gravestone Girls. It's a fabulous place. Uh, it is a repository for all things printed. If it was printed up to 1850 and in some cases beyond, whether it was a map, a diary, a newspaper, a, a 
handbill, et cetera, it, if it was printed during, with those, in those time periods, they want it. And if they don't, if they want it, if they don't already have it, and they've got a huge, huge repository that you can use their resources for scholarly purposes, for, for research purposes, you can schedule an appointment to go in, or they've got a lot of stuff online that you can access as well. And I don't, you don't need to be a member to do that, I don't believe. There is also the New England Historic Genealogical Society, lovingly known as uh, New England HisGen. They are based in Boston. They are the same kind of repository as the American Antiquarian Society, but they aren't just print. Uh, and they deal more with the idea of, of genealogical information. Uh, they've got a lot of great information online, but they also have additional information that's uh, available to you as a member. And they will also do, uh, you can hire them to do research work for you through their collection. The New England Regional Genealogical Consortium is one of my favorites. Uh, they are a, the New England Genealogy Group all come together. They have a biannual conference. Next year is 2021, uh, next year, and it's in April, and it's going to be virtual. And they are, they, they are certainly, every, every state has them, every region has them. There are uh, society groups on the national level, on the federal level. I use these guys as an example of a regional one with all sorts of different genealogical groups included in them and a, a great resource for information. So the next one is New Hampshire Old Graveyard Association, lovingly called Nahoga, the Rhode Island Historical Cemetery Commission, Cape Cod Gravestones, the Vermont Old Cemetery Association, lovingly called Boca, and the Maine Old Cemetery Association, lovingly called MOCA, and then the Connecticut Gravestone Network. These are all state or, or uh, regional based in the state, like the Cape Cod Gravestones is a website for gravestones on the Cape in Massachusetts. But these are all regional uh, organizations with great information about gravestones and graveyards, cemeteries in their respective location. So they have. They are a great place to go if you're looking for all kinds of information about cemeteries, gravestones, carvers, imagery, tours, preservation. Make sure you make use of them. They love to talk to you and they're very, very helpful organizations. So I may have warned you or I may not have warned you, but I can talk about this stuff forever, but I have actually come to the close. Uh, my job is to, to show you that cemeteries are they're fun and educational places. They are living, living history and art museums. They are free and open to the public in most cases. And certainly for my genealogists, an invaluable resource uh, for, for, your, for your information and a way to reach out there through the past. Um, it may be a little chilly today in Massachusetts uh, or wherever you are, it's still plenty of daylight. Get out there and do some sleuthing. Uh, I just wanted to do one last plug for the girls. Uh, even though there's a pandemic on, we're actually busy, busy, busy. We're in all kinds of virtual markets and some live markets. I just came back this morning from one in Philadelphia and I'll be on the road to West Virginia for a, an art market in the cemetery in Martinsburg, Virginia. So if you're anywhere near Martinsburg, come out for the market. There will be tours, there'll be presentations, there'll be art vendors, and it's in the cemetery. So really, how can you go wrong? So come and visit. So I am going to pull my screen back up here, bring my librarians back in. My thanks to the, to the library, my thanks to the genealogy group, and certainly my thanks to the DAR for sponsoring this and having us this Sunday afternoon. I will tell you that if it was not for the pandemic, I would not be here. I'm typically outside at markets every weekend in October. So it's a nice change for me. I haven't had a Sunday off in October in uh, 15 years or something like that. So I got time. I'll take questions uh, if we don't get to them all or you 
you have uh, questions after the fact, you come up with something, just drop us a line through social media or the website, email, and uh, we'll chat some more with you. Brenda, there's lots of thanks here on the chat for you. Sure. Fantastic. Thank you, Brenda. This was excellent. There are a couple of questions, not many. Um, from Sue McCann, does Massachusetts have a gravestone association? We have the Association for Gravestone Studies um, that's headquartered in Greenfield on Western Mass. There are several chapters. So there is a Western New England chapter, so it's not just Mass. There's a chapter for Western New England. There's a chapter for Northeast New England. And there was one for the Cape, I think. So it, it, it's really for all of the six, uh, six states of, of New England. Um, they meet, at least I know that the Western ones get together twice a year. I think the Northeast does too. But the chapters were created as a way to get down into, it, it closer to the community so that we might be able to get members out in, in exploring, get us together more than just once a year at the annual conference. There are also chapters in, in Texas. There was one in Chicago. Arizona's got one. Uh, we've got a bunch. I don't, I don't know what number we're up to, but the Association for Gravestone Studies has a whole list of them on the webpage, uh, gravestonestudies.org. And the chapters have their own pages. And I do know that next Saturday, because I can't go, because I'm going to be in Virginia, um, I always miss them, but the Western New England chapter is doing a meetup. And it's in, I think it's in Montgomery, which is Northeast Massachusetts. Um, there'll be a couple of presentations, people talking about different subjects. And there'll be a walk in at least one, if not more than one, cemetery in the, in the area. So check them out. You can get to them from the AGS website or um, look up the Western New England Gravestone Association chapter or something. Go to AGS and, and it'll read you there. Great. There is one other uh, question. I'm going to read it. Um, I, this is from Deb. I have an ancestor's headstone engraved with an index finger pointing to heaven. However, above the carving are the words, boys do right. Date of, date of death is May 1865, end of Civil War. Person was 83 years old. Any idea what that might refer to? Ooh. Well, while it is not unusual to have something across the top of the stone on the, over that pointing finger, so you're absolutely right, that pointing finger is pointing to the next world. Um, what I usually see with that is some sentiment like gone home or um, there is rest in heaven. You know, we had that example with the husband and the three wives that rest in heaven. Um, Boys do right. Is that what you said? Boys do right. Yes. Hey, fabulous. I haven't got a clue, but I love it. You know what? You could send us a picture. Um, so if he's 83 years old, he's got no connection to the Civil War, you know, in terms of fighting. Um, I did put your um, email address in the chat. So yeah, uh, maybe so, that. So what I'm thinking is when, when you read any of those kind of sentiments and when you read epitaphs on the bottoms of the gravestones, they aren't, typically they are not personal. Like, you know, I don't write my husband's epitaph. If I read an epitaph on a gravestone, it is more likely to be something from the Bible, part of a hymn, um, part of contemporary literature at the time, something that would be easily recognized. Mm -hmm. by the reader, not personal sentimentality. So I would Google that and boys do right. That, that sounds like it's a slogan for something, whether it's, a, whether it's a school, like an alma mater thing, or maybe a military thing, you know, like, like Semper Fi, Semper Fi. Um, 
unusual but really cool but i i will go again out on a limb and i bet you will be able to tie that to some kind of organization huh. boy scouts maybe something like that mm. yeah wow. yeah i i'm i'm gonna guess that it's it's got something to do with some sort of, of fraternal group or or yep. some kind of service organization that's so cool see i learn stuff all the time um, there's a question from D. Did you participate in the NERGC? The, I do. Uh, conference? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in so NERC is every other year, and it moves between Nashua, New Hampshire, and Manchester, maybe. Mash. Yeah, Manchester and Connecticut. It used to be in Rhode Island, too. I think it it used to be in three places. Uh, but I've been going to the NERC conferences for a long time. They were actually one of the first, I think they were the first genealogy conference I went to. Uh, I set up in the vendor room with all the other great vendors. I bring my gravestones. I meet lots of fabulous people. Uh, it brings me programming like this. I sell a lot of gravestone castings. I get commissions, but I also get to sneak away sometimes out of the vendor room and sit in on the programming because the, the topics are just the, the lecture topics that go on for the three or four days that NERC lasts is they're just fascinating. And it, it's a it's a great organization to to go learn all kinds of things about how you how you dig up information. Mm -hmm. And while I'm sad that next year their 20, 2021 is their they're on the odd years for conference. They've already decided that they're going to be virtual, so I'll be able to be there as a vendor. But the great thing is, I don't have to be at my table, so I will get to sit in on a lot more of the a lot more of the lectures. It just it's fascinating content, very very educational. Um, I just want to thank um, Jennifer Schuer for doing a little research on the fly here because she did find. She did some newspapers.com research and found the um, the last words in an article on uh, uh, the farmer and the mechanic newspaper. Um, it looks like they're on the right track. So thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, someone else did a little research too. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer, Brenda. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Did I miss anything, Katie? I think um, there are no oh, other questions as far there's as there's one. Tell. Uh, there's one from earlier. Oh. Um, during your presentation, when you were showing the photos of the cemeteries um, from the different time periods, yeah. um, Martha wants to know if the photo from of the modern cemetery is Sleepy Hollow in Concord, Mass. Uh, it is not. I can't tell you where it is because I don't remember, but it is not. No. Sleepy Hollow in Concord does have modern section. Uh, but it's a relatively small cemetery, and that was a that was a pretty large piece of landscape. Yeah, that's a great question. I I could not even tell you where it comes from. And I guess that just goes to show, you know, where she thought it might be Sleepy Hollow, and I can't tell you where it comes from. It goes to show you that 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 style, as a modern style, is is very ubiquitous. Awesome. Great. And Martha says thank you. Thank you, Martha. There are lots of thanks, lots of accolades here for you. Thank you so Thank much for, for joining us today. I'm sorry that you're not in Salem. That's where I grew up, so I know it's awesome at this time I of year. I hear it's still mayhem. But, my, oh. my friends, yeah, my friends that have brick and mortar shops up there are reporting tons of people in the street. Wow. It's crazy. Wow. Um, well, maybe next year we'll all get to go. Um, thank you so much for being here. This is this has been really great. Your presentation was wonderful and lots of good information. Thank you so much.